Hey there art nerds, I encourage you to paint along with me today as we paint this miniature farmer's market. If you have a copy of my coloring book, Curious Little Things, you'll find that this is one of the illustrations included in the book as well as a downloadable line art. So if you'd like to paint along with me, make sure that you've got the book, you print it out, and you've got your paper of choice. I'm going to be working with my Daily Driver watercolor palette today. It's got lots of beautiful convenience colors, but you can paint along with whatever watercolor palette you happen to have and you happen to like. So let's get ready to paint. So grab your paper, grab your brushes, and let's get started with painting this tiny farmer's market. I'm starting out with an illustration that has been printed onto Stonehenge Aqua Cold Press watercolor paper. I have already penciled it and I have re-inked it. I'm stretching it on some plastic gator board and I'm using 3M blue painters tape to help secure my watercolor illustration. I printed it out using an inkjet printer and that's why you guys saw it move just a little bit when I spritzed it with water. If you like my art and you'd like to see more of it, make sure you follow me on these social media media sites. So after it's had plenty of time to dry, honestly, maybe kind of weeks even to dry, I'm ready to start painting it. And I'm starting by doing a really warm underpainting using some new gamboge. And I want to start with some semi-opaque yellows because it's going to give us that really beautiful, bright, sunshiny yellow. Next, I am using French cerulean to start painting in the sky. This is a cooler blue that isn't necessarily necessarily as cool as a phthalo blue and it is also a little bit opaque so it can stand up nicely to our new gamboge. It also granulates just a little bit which is really beautiful on this more heavily bodied more textured cold press watercolor paper. Next I'm going to start out by doing an underpainting using phthalo blue to start knocking in the shadows. I really want this to feel like a bright warm summer day and by establishing my shadows early, it's going to make it easier to keep my light source in mind. It's also going to help establish some of the contrast and for some of the lighter colors or the colors that can't stand up to as many layers or as much glazing this is going to provide some much needed shadow. Now something I want to point out to you guys is unedited this footage was 11 hours <laughs> of painting. That does not include dry times, that does not include the initial sketch, or even the inking. 11 hours. I actually had to render it out twice to get it short enough that I thought people might watch it. And I want to point this out because art takes time and too many people think that it should be instantaneous or that you should be able to produce a full watercolor illustration once per day. And as somebody who does share a lot of her work as time-lapse tutorials, I do feel somewhat responsible for that. So I wanted to let you guys know that not including dry times, break times, rest times, which are all very necessary when making art. This was 11 hours. This took about a week to paint. So just keep that in mind. Be patient with yourself. Art takes time to produce. So once my first layer of grisade dried, I splattered in some more of our new gamboge. And this is going to kind of create the effect of like dust motes hitting the sunlight. And it's also going to add a little bit of grit and texture, which is going to add some visual interest. This is one of the reasons why I love watercolors that have a little bit of opacity to them, that have a little bit of granulation to them, that can just add something special to my traditional artwork that makes it feel like I actually painted it by hand because I did. So I'm going in with a more saturated mix of our phthalo blue, and I'm starting to block in some of our darker shadows and establishing the light source just a little bit better. I am painting with silver black velvet watercolor brushes 
We don't have any kind of affiliation. I don't have any sponsors whatsoever, but they're what I like. And if you're looking for a good watercolor brush that's gonna stay in the tests of time and that your cat's not gonna try to eat, silver black velvet watercolor brushes might be a good option for you. That said, I have recently reviewed a bunch of watercolor brushes from AliExpress that seem to be very promising. So if you're on the lookout for good, affordable watercolor brushes, I hope you guys will keep an eye out for that review. If you're struggling with lighting your watercolor illustrations or with light and contrast, I have a couple of suggestions. One, I have a default light source that I always kind of just rely on unless I have a designated light source in the scene or in the illustration. So typically I assume that my light is coming from the upper right hand corner, usually in front of or behind the characters themselves. This helps me keep it consistent. Two, you can do light and contrast studies at your own home by setting up a still life and paying particular attention to your light sources, varying where you place your light sources and how the light hits and affects the objects that they're on. So speaking of, I'm working on the sky just a little bit more. You guys could really see both the opacity as well as the granulation in our French cerulean blue. And then you guys can see me kind of I'm trying to like angle it up in the sky to really give the impression of like sunbeams and that really strong light source. Now, to indicate a strong light source, you're gonna have to have some pretty strong shadows. And that's one of the things we tried to establish early on and that we're going to keep working as we continue to work on this piece. Now, I felt like I lost some of that beautiful warm sunniness. So I wanted to go back in with our new gamboge and kind of add it again, working from the top right corner, which is our designated light source for this illustration. I'm going to spend a lot of time working on the underpainting and establishing the shadows on this piece because this is where a lot of the thought is going in. Every piece of art is about 80% thought and 20% doing and we're all on an artistic journey here. We're all still learning and we're all still growing. But one thing I've noticed about my own work when I don't particularly like it is I didn't spend enough time thinking about it, which is one of the reasons I wanted to point out to you guys earlier that it took me about a week to paint this because there was a lot of time spent looking at it and thinking about it, sleeping on it and thinking about it, taking notes and thinking about it. And if that's not part of your art process, that might be a way that you can improve your art without actually having to do a lot of painting or a lot of physical labor or spending a lot of money is by investing that time into thinking it, thinking about it, sorry. Again, with the underpainting, this time we're going in even darker, still working with phthalo blue, this time mixing in a little bit of indigo because I couldn't quite get the depth of color that I was looking for. Now you guys remember the top of the illustration, all this phthalo blue was not that noticeable in the final piece. I bet you guys didn't even know it was in there, but it's kind of my secret weapon for these kind of paintings, doing a lot of the underpainting, almost painting the thing in monochrome first, and then adding my local color or the color of the actual objects on top of that. So I'm gonna start now with painting the ground that they're standing on. Often when it comes to watercolor, I like to fill the large areas first because typically those tend to utilize lighter washes, looser washes. I'm using more water and they have a tendency to reactivate other colors, especially more heavily applied colors. So I find that if I don't want things to bleed, I should paint these areas first. Now, often I do want a little bit of bleeding. I want a little bit of color mixing. I want a little bit of controlled chaos to just kind of liven up my work. But in this instance, I wanted to make sure that the dirt wasn't bleeding up into the characters themselves. So I'm handling it first. Now, I mentioned earlier that I am painting on Stonehenge Aqua Cold Press watercolor paper. This is a very particular paper. It's got its own little peccadillos and it's not really for everyone. I like that it is a cotton rag paper, 
I like that it has a very assertive surface texture. I like that it can handle a lot of water, but something you should be aware of if you're working with Stonehenge Aqua is that once it's open, once you've got it really saturated with water, it's very easy for it to start to look muddy. It's very easy for the color to reactivate. It's really easy to kind of lose sight of what you're painting. So if you're working with this paper, I would recommend giving it plenty of breaks, giving it plenty of rest time, and giving those fibers a chance to dry out and close back up, especially if you want to add details on top of it. This ties in with, you know, taking breaks, the 80% thinking, 20% doing, and the just being patient with yourself and with your art. So now we're going to start working on the next largest area, which would be the shelves. Now, there's a lot of different ways I kind of wanted to handle this, but we're going to have a lot of really bright and vibrant fruits and vegetables. And I really want those and the characters to be the focus of this illustration. And that means keeping the shelves and the baskets and the background fairly simple, fairly neutral so that they don't distract too much. That's an area that I'm trying to work on is not, you know, just destroying the focus of the illustration. So I'm keeping the shelves pretty neutral with brown tones. Something else I kind of want to talk about is I don't know if you guys have realized this, but a lot of how I like to depict characters and situations and scenarios is heavily inspired by Norman Rockwell's illustrations. I really like capturing these sort of day-to-day -day interactions and kind of capturing this sort of humanity, even if the creatures I am depicting are Lilliputians and not full-size humans. I think that just adds a little bit of whimsy and hopefully that encourages people to kind of see the world around them with fresh eyes. Maybe the next time you guys go to the farmer's market, if you have a farmer's market in your area that you can enjoy, maybe you'll go with fresh eyes and think about how you might approach this if you were only seven inches tall. It's just a fun way to kind of add a new spin to day-to-day -day life. Something else that I want to point out to you guys because it isn't apparent is that for the fruits and veggies that I'm going to be painting, I'm going to be working heavily from visual reference. I've got Google up and running and I am Googling everything because while you might think you know how something looks, reference tells you how it looks and you can go from thinking you know how it looks to knowing how it looks and that's something that's just not as apparent i'm not necessarily a realistic painter realism is not where my heart is i really like this kind of looser cartoony art that's what i went to school for that's what holds my heart but even though i'm not trying to draw or paint in a fully realistic manner i still want things to look the way they're supposed to look. I want them to be recognizable. So for the sunflower, I went ahead and I painted kind of a base layer of yellow, a warmer yellow, since we are painting a sunflower here. And then while it's still wet and the paper's still open, I start working in more oranges and Indian yellows and just warmer, browner yellow tones into our sunflower. And it's not obvious here because obviously I turn the camera off when I'm letting things dry, but I am giving areas time to dry because if you want to get those kind of standout details, if you want your colors to not just bleed into your other colors, you do need to allow the area to dry so that you can add your next layer on top of it and they won't bleed into each other. Something else to keep in mind is that watercolor tends to dry lighter and less saturated than it looks when it's wet. Now, one of the things I really like about cotton rag papers is that they do a much better job, in my opinion, of reflecting the color the way you think it looks when it's wet, that beautiful scintillating sort of jewel tone. It's going to be much more vibrant on a cotton rag paper than on a cellulose paper, but cotton rag papers are more expensive than cellulose papers. Now, over the years, I have talked a lot about watercolor supplies and what I like about watercolor supplies and which are my favorites. And while I have reviewed a lot of watercolor supplies over the years, and I do have different use cases for different things, my main feelings about art supplies have not changed 
so, so much over the years. So if you're interested in learning more about watercolor or what supplies might be good for you or what might work in your scenario, I've got some great playlists that I'll link for you guys down in the description below. So it's hard for me with these really super time-lapse videos to really get granular about how I'm handling each individual part what I'm doing for each individual thing. Like, so for these kumquats, those orange fruits there at the top, I actually added in a little bit of red and I'm adding in more red now because I wanted to develop the shadow, but oranges and yellows can be kind of tricky to paint because depending on what you're doing, you may not want to just go in with like a neutral tint or a cooler tint or a purple because that may desaturate it too much and really deaden the color. So sometimes it's helpful to use the color that's right next to it on the color wheel that's just a little bit cooler. So in that instance, it would be a red and you can even go with a cooler red if you want to, to really start adding in more of the shadow. But that's another reason why I did all that phthalo blue underpainting is we've got those shadows already kind of worked in and it kind of unifies the piece. By having an underpainting like this, it kind of keeps the light source and the shadow source consistent. You can add shadows in in addition to those shadows later, but it just kind of ties everything together and it makes it feel like it's all taking place in the same environment. And I find that to be really helpful with my illustration work is using this kind of underpainting early on. So initially this illustration started out as part of a Lilliputian living challenge. I was thinking in black and white, not necessarily thinking in color. However, with a farmer's market stall, there is a lot of opportunity to kind of tweak the colors to make sure you have the color story that you're looking for. I wanted to make sure that we really captured the wide, beautiful array of colors that are available in fresh fruits and vegetables. So for example, those little tomatoes there, those would be heirloom Creole tomatoes. So they have a beautiful range of colors from greens to almost like purple. Some people refer to them as chocolate color, but I, I think it's more of like a beautiful sort of reddish purple to yellows and oranges. So that gives me an opportunity to introduce a lot more color. The jalapenos are the same thing. Green jalapenos are actually unripe jalapeno peppers. So they can range from green to yellow to red, and that can be a great opportunity to adjust the colors that we're using and to kind of change the color story. Now, there were some things that I knew needed to be a specific color. So like for the shallots, for example, those are the oniony looking things kind of down by the bottom. I wanted to really capture the beautiful brownish purple that's going on there. So I wanted to utilize a little bit of wet and wet and get that kind of diffused color. So at this stage, I'm really trying to block things in. I'm going to leave some things not painted because I'm still trying to decide what colors I want to use for them. I want to see how the other colors turn out. And with watercolor, you can do a digital color comp and that can be very helpful. But I also find it's important to understand that you're going to have to be flexible and play it by ear to a certain degree. You may think you know how everything's going to look, but maybe your color mix wasn't quite right, or maybe you were overly inspired by something and you really leaned into it. So allowing yourself room to change your mind last minute and allowing yourself room for flexibility can be really helpful, even for let's call it more structured watercolor illustration like this. While I am working with ceramic plates and palettes for color mixing, I have a lot of one-off color mixes that I need. And as you guys can see, I am utilizing the blue painter's tape on the side of my illustration. This is something that I've done for years. I would not call it a tip because it has also backfired on me a few times. It's never like sunk all the way through and stained the illustration, but I have gotten it on my hand and almost dragged it all over my art. So uh, it's a lazy convenience thing that I do that might work for you or it might drive you, drive you up the wall. You might hate seeing it. I, I don't know, but it works for me. And I did want to point it out to you guys as an option. It is something that you can do, but um, it is not something you have to do. So with the peppers, I wanted to add a lot more shadow to the green, the peppers I knew were going to be green peppers. So I went ahead and I did a much thicker 
more saturated version of our phthalo blue and our indigo on the peppers to really kind of get that glossiness that you see with jalapenos. And for our peas, I really wanted to capture that freshness. So I started with an underpainting of a very light, cool yellow, kind of an opaque yellow. And then I glazed a blue on top of it so that we get this really bright, beautiful green. I'm going to use a hooker's green for the main basis of the jalapenos. This is a bluer green and it's convenience color. It's pre-mixed, but I really like having a lot of convenience colors on hand. I find that it makes doing these kinds of illustrations just a lot easier for me. Yes, you can mix almost every color you need from a good 12 color mixing palette, but you're going to spend a lot of time mixing and swatching and mixing. So as you find colors you like that you want to add to your palette that make it easier for you to paint your favorite things, I really recommend you do so. And honestly, I paint a lot of people and I paint a lot of nature. And that means I use a lot of earth pigments and that could take up a good 12 color palette in and of itself. So with these kind of illustrations, I also like to work from knowns to unknowns. And what I mean by that is there are going to be certain colors I know I'm going to use when painting the fruits and vegetables. So I'm gonna paint those first and then kind of see how I feel about the overall color palette of the piece and utilize either complementary or contrasting colors for the character's clothing to make them either blend in with the environment more if that's what I want or to make them pop from the environment more. One area in my watercolor illustration that I think I've really kind of changed my stance on but haven't talked about enough is the use of opaque and semi-opaque colors. There was a time where I wanted everything to be pretty transparent because it does make for easier mixes. You're less likely to mix mud if you're not kind of contending with opacity and granulation. But over the years, I've really fallen in love with granulating and honestly, many granulating colors are also fairly opaque watercolors because they have some unique properties. More opaque, more granulating colors are easier to lift. So if there's an area you wanna rework, it's pretty easy to do that. They will also stand up to other colors. So for example, if I paint something green, but it ends up too blue, I can do a really nice glaze of an opaque yellow on it. And it's actually going to make a difference, especially because yellows are the color that tends to get lost very easily. Adding these kind of opaque yellows, both cool and warm to your palette, gives them a fighting chance and can allow for some really beautiful colors and really interesting watercolor effects. I feel a little bit guilty. I feel like I've talked about some really great overarching watercolor concepts, but I haven't really been able to dive into the specifics with this illustration. I have some really good tutorials here on the channel where I am able to dive into certain topics in much more depth and really explain my thought process and what I'm doing step by step. But with these kind of massive time lapses, and by that, I mean they were time-lapsed to a large degree. It's really difficult to be able to explain things step by step. And I'm going to just kind of deviate on topic just a little bit to talk about the necessity of that. So here on YouTube, people really don't want to watch art videos. They'll watch art advice videos, particularly if you can promise the moon and stars, but tutorials, especially for things like this, are just not a particularly popular topic. So I can't really get away with uploading a four hour long watercolor video. I think I could do a four hour long live stream and it do well, but as a tutorial, people would quickly lose interest. So it's beneficial to break the topic up into subtopics and talk about them more. And I'll revisit that in a second. I want to explain what I'm doing here. So I want the lady up at the top to have a darker skin tone. So I'm also utilizing underpainting techniques for her. So I am starting with the shadow colors. So I'm using a purple that complements darker skin tones really well while still adding some shadow and kind of cooling down some areas. And I'm also introducing the earlier stages of the blush. And one of the reasons I like to do this is because earth pigments, which are what I primarily use when painting skin tones like this, 
tend, not always, but tend to be more opaque. So it can be very challenging to do light glazes on top of them without them reactivating and lifting and turning into a mess. So adding in the basis of the shadows and the basis of the blush early on allows me to create a more nuanced skin tone than I would be able to create if I was just doing like the way I handle lighter skin tones. So um, I could actually use these underpainting techniques with lighter skin tones and I do from time to time. It makes things just easier when establishing shadows, but with lighter skin tones, because you're not dealing with as much opacity or as much pigment, it is a little bit easier to kind of go in and glaze your shadows on top of that. So I wanted her to have kind of an ombre effect to her hair, like her hair had gotten kind of sun bleached. So I start with a yellow and then while that's still wet up towards the roots I dab in some brown and this is an area that's going to require a bit more work to make it look right but I'm just kind of establishing the basis for that here so cycling back to the prior topic so I can't get away with four hour time lapses so I have to crunch it down to about an hour I really I know 20 minute videos on YouTube do much better for me than my hour long videos do. But realistically, if I crunch this down to 20 minutes, it'll be pretty to look at, but I'm not gonna be able to say hardly anything at all. So I'm trying to kind of split the difference. But if you guys ever want a more step-by-step -step in depth walkthrough for something like this, I would love to do that maybe it's, it's a difficult thing to do anyway because as a live stream it doesn't work because of dry times and because it takes multiple days and as a video it doesn't work because just frankly the file size becomes so massive that I can't I can't export it using the methods that I'm using so I do have some tutorials where I explain things in more depth but they're a little bit more simple hopefully though um if you guys have been watching what I do for a while, you kind of get the gist of it. And we're at the point where we can start talking about some of the more overarching topics. Because as somebody with ADHD, I love novelty. So I get a little bit bored explaining the same things over and over again. And I know some people really enjoy that. And I do find repetition to be helpful when learning. So it's a balancing act that I am still trying to figure out. So we have a lot of green in this illustration, particularly where this little lady is, the little girl there. So I decided her dress should be red because that's really going to pop and contrast and make her noticeable. And since we have a lot of green and we're about to have a lot of red, yellow is a color that I didn't use. I mean, it is used in this piece, so it's not an unusual color, but it pops against the greens and the reds and the shadows. So I decided that a warmer yellow would work really well for his shirt. So um, I'm just kind of developing the clothing at this point and still kind of thinking about what I want different, like what kind of color palette do I want to use for their outfits, right? Because when it comes to putting together outfits, yeah, you can design characters where their outfit just totally clashes and that's a valid choice, but that's not the only choice available and sometimes you want your characters to look coordinated so it's always kind of me weighing my options and then since these are lilliputians realistically they don't want to dress too too flashy because that would make them noticeable to humans and to animals that might predate on them so it's always a balancing act between do i dress them in clothing that is eye-catching and fun to look at or do I dress them in clothing that would be practical and, uh, you know, develop that world building? So that's always something that I'm kind of thinking about when I'm working on these illustrations. But I figured if they feel safe enough to have a farmer's market, then they probably can get away with bright and vibrant colors. You guys probably noticed that I withheld working on the characters until we got a lot of the background painted because realistically while this is a story of a young boy and his younger sister having an interaction with this person they are going shopping and they're buying something from her it is also about look at all this beautiful fresh produce doesn't this make you want to go get some fresh veggies doesn't this make you want to start a garden so it's a balancing act between <laughs> like not really being an ad but kind of being an ad for like look at the beautiful summer produce and um telling the story about 
a child who's like going out and taking care of some of the family shopping and is bringing his younger sister along you know just for the entertainment because she's probably not a whole lot of help she looks like she's got her hands full just with that doll there Now, as I'm working, I'm trying to make sure that I have enough contrast. And I don't just mean colors that contrast and bounce off one another. I'm also talking about light and shadow contrast. Now, I've seen a tip recently on TikTok that I haven't had a chance to implement, but apparently red glasses will kind of block out most of the color and will allow you to see mostly just the value in your watercolor illustrator or your your traditional media illustration in general. And that's something I think would be really fun to try out. I just haven't gotten around to ordering myself a pair of red glasses. Supposedly any red piece of glass will work strangely. I don't have like a red stained glass window or <laughs> like red drinking glasses that I could use for this. So I was gonna order myself a, a pair of rose tinted glasses for this this purpose but I think that would be a fun thing to try out and report back to you guys on how it works of course you can also take a, a photo of it and play around with it in Photoshop you can convert it to grayscale and check your values there uh, but you know I kind of like the idea of the red glasses that's also something just like you can take on take off and put on as you work on the piece instead of having to stop and take a picture and <laughs> share it with yourself and open it in Photoshop and that just seems like something I probably wouldn't actually do. So now that I've got more of the illustration kind of rendered out I can actually afford to start painting and start deciding the colors that I want to use for the objects that aren't quite as important. So the baskets, for example, I don't necessarily want them to detract or distract too much from the fruits and vegetables and the characters. And I kind of, <laughs> kind of took a, a cheapy way out. I'm using a yellow ochre to kind of do a straw color for most of these baskets. It makes practical sense. It's not quite as decorative, sure, but it would work. It's not something that just is totally out of the realm of possibility. And there isn't necessarily a lot of yellow in this illustration. And I wanted this illustration to feel really light and bright and airy. So keeping the baskets as straw baskets kind of facilitates that. It keeps the color palette on the lighter end. If I was telling a different kind of story, like maybe this is at sunset and I want everything to be just a little bit more darker and have a little bit more shadow, I could go with a darker color for the baskets and that would help facilitate that color story as well. It's kind of funny. I knew what color I wanted for the farmer's hair from the get-go. I wanted something really reminiscent of the sunflower that she's using as an umbrella, but I hadn't quite decided on what hair color to do for the kids. And I ended up going with a darker hair color, mostly because it contrasts without distracting too much from the produce around them. It's an area of darkness against all these areas of bright colors. So that's also going to help draw the viewer's attention. And I can also kind of make it pretty by really relying on my brush to kind of leave the shine in the hair. And the way we do that is we start out either with a really, really light undercolor just to kind of tone it or just leaving it with the color of the page wherever that has ended up. Then doing another wash with just a little bit darker, maybe to start introducing the color of the hair. And we're really gonna leave a lot of that first color still visible. And we just kind of keep working it like that. And if you find the shine is too strong or too distracting, or it's in kind of a weird place, you can always kind of reactivate the colors and kind of scrub them into the area where you want them. The earth tones are really forgiving like that. So I mentioned earlier that this illustration took about a week and there's a lot going on. There's like a lot of small objects that need to be rendered in this illustration. So it is understandable that this illustration took a while, but there was a point where I felt like I was just kind of 
swimming in circles or doggy paddling with this. Like I was working on it and I was picking at it, but I wasn't really making any progress. And I've found that that's becoming more of a common thing with my watercolor, especially when I'm being called out of the house a lot, or I don't necessarily have like big chunks of time to sit and just paint because you're spending a lot of time like kind of getting in the painting mindset and kind of figuring out where you want to take the illustration or like trying to get back in your mind from where you were last time. Now, one of the things I do to combat this is I actually have a Discord server for myself and it's called Notes to Self. And I will post a photo of what I'm working on, like the latest one and leave myself little critique notes. So like when I sit down again and I'm able to work, I have areas that I can like think about and address instead of like trying to recreate my train of thought and you don't have to do this like on discord it could be in a notepad it can be on a post-it it can be you know it, it's whatever works for you one of the reasons i like doing it on discord is because i have a pet rat and we do free roam time together so in fact i'm narrating while i'm playing with basil right now and um I can kind of look at my work and think about it while I'm playing with Basil. And uh, I've mentioned this before, but I'm just gonna, you know, forestall this because there's always that one person who hears rat singular. So I'm gonna explain the story of Basil very quickly while I'm kind of blocking in all these areas, adding in some additional co color contrast to just kind of draw the eye around the image. So Basil was found as a pinky. He was found in a street grate. His sibling next to him was dead i scooped basil up brought him home i thought he was a baby squirrel called the squirrel rescue they told me i had a rat on my hands and i decided to raise him so he is a roof rat he's never actually known any other rats and the vet he goes to recommended that i not introduce him to any other rats because one of them will end up dead Basil is a sweetheart. He gets lots of playtime. He gets lots of treats. He gets lots of attention, but he's not really in a position for any friends. Again, one of them may kill the other, and then I would be stuck with just one rat. So <laughs> that is the story of Basil. So at this point, I have everything blocked in and I'm just going in and I'm adjusting that contrast like we talked about. And there's a few colors I really like for this, just good all rounders. One of them is neutral tint. Different companies, neutral tints, some of them are warmer, some of them are cooler. Um, I really like Holbein's neutral tint. It's kind of like a denim color, but what I have in my palette is Windsor and Newton's neutral tint. It's really more of a gray and it works well in these kind of situations like where I'm trying to block in the shadows a little bit more. I'm trying to adjust the contrast a bit because it doesn't totally deaden the color and it just kind of works well with most colors. If you're working with kind of a more botanical piece with a lot of greens in it, a phthalo blue or an indigo, especially a cooler indigo, would be really beautiful for that. If you're working with warmer tones that aren't yellows purples would work really well with that for that if you're working with a piece that has a lot a lot of yellows especially warm yellows in it and you want to keep that warmth a magenta would work pretty well as kind of a a shadowing color to kind of add some depth into it but it's one of those things where the more you do it and the more you play around, the more confident you're going to be with it. And I have been painting every day, every pretty much every single day, if I'm not sick with a migraine, um, for the past 10 years. So I'm still learning a lot. I still have a lot to learn. And I think actually trying things out is one of the best ways to learn. So I encourage you to not just watch, but to pick up your own paintbrush and paint along if you can. I wanted to introduce more of like kind of those sun flecks. So after things dried, I splattered in some bismuth yellow, which is a, it's kind of a middle yellow. It's not really a cool yellow. It's not really a warm yellow. It's right in between the two. And it is a more opaque yellow. So it will actually stand up against the colors that we've already put on. If I had done a transparent yellow, a lot of that would get kind of lost. But by using an opaque yellow, it starts to look like sunflakes. And then once everything dried, I pull out my watercolor pencils. Now, I love watercolor pencils. I don't like using them on their own, but I love what they can help me do with my watercolor illustrations. They can really help me add in shadows, add in details, tighten things up, 
add some rim lighting, like especially on the skin to really make the skin kind of stand out from like if it's too close to an area where they're too similar, like certain hair colors, it, it can get lost like that. Fantastic. One recommendation I have is that if you like to render darker skinned people and you're using a white, also get an off white. It's a little bit warmer and it just works really well as a rim light color on darker skin tones without like deadening, deadening the color or the skin tone the way white tends to. I really wish somebody would make like an antique white or an, anti, um, an off white gouache. I have gone looking for them. I know there's Jean Brilliant. I know there's roses and colors like that but there isn't an antique white like I'm looking for and I even have titanium buff in my palette and that is too gray and too dead for what I'm really looking for I could mix it myself but y'all know by now that I like it easy I like my convenience colors speaking of something else I really like about color pencils especially when it comes to rendering foliage and greenery is that you can use a cool yellow and kind of just gently pencil it on top and then another beautiful thing is that watercolor pencils are so good for adding surface design to fabrics like we're doing here. In fact, I decided to add a little plaid print to his shirt. Basically, after his shirt was done, I'm just glazing it on top of the dry watercolor. Let that layer dry, doing a more saturated dry over dry application. And what dry over dry means is, um, the, the watercolor is still wet. <laughs> it has to be wet to work, but it's much, much, much thicker. It's not as liquidy. And then when I am just about finished, I pull out the old white gouache and use it to start adding in some highlights. And that is why I was complaining that I would love a pre-mixed off-white gouache for this. However, I have moved to a much bigger palette now and I have a bunch of opaque colors and pastels in there for that purpose. So hopefully that'll make that a lot easier. But I just really love this part of the process because adding in those highlights really adjusts the contrast and it just really makes everything pop. And I'm going to still be blending in colors, adding in shadows, making adjustments. So after that has all had a chance to dry, one thing I have noticed is that things look a little bit muddy because we were painting on top of a black and white line art. So we've lost a lot of the contrast that the line art originally had because we introduced so many opaque and semi-opaque colors. So what I like to do is I will re-ink it. And I don't re-ink the whole thing, just the areas that need need that black contrast, that need that definition, that need that delineation. Again, it cleans it up just a little bit. It reintroduces some contrast and it just kind of rebalances the illustration. It makes it look a lot cleaner and not as muddy because one of the big things I have found with watercolor is make it look intentional. If you make a, make a mistake, make it look intentional. Work with your piece to make it look like you made this decision. And I find that when you make it look intentional even with happy accidents you end up with a stronger piece overall so i've really been enjoying like trying to make chaos and then find intentionality within the chaos that's just so fun and watercolor is such a good medium for that I do like trying out watercolor tips from time to time and it was recommended to me that a hair dryer set on low warm would make removing the adhesive easier because it melted a little bit. That was not the case. That was not my experience. I don't know why. As you guys can see, it still ripped that paper. This paper was on the stretcher for a long time. I wasn't able to get to this illustration for a few months. So that is quite possibly it. I did allow it to dry fully before I removed it, but this is why I pull away at a 90 degree angle. And so it doesn't tear into the illustration. It tears the paper outside of the illustration and it's much easier to fix. But look, I did try the hair dryer technique it didn't work for me. If it works for you, that is fantastic. What are you doing that I am messing up? But here we have the finished watercolor illustration. 
I love how this piece turned out. It's so warm. It's so vibrant. It's so sunny. It just gives me like such happy farmer's market vibes. And I mean, I come from a family of teachers and farmers. My mom's dad was a farmer. My dad grew up in a family of farmers. So I have a lot of fondness for that, even though I do not have a green thumb. I am much better with animals than I am with plants. But thank you guys so much for painting with me today. I hope you guys enjoyed it. If you don't have a copy of my coloring book, Curious Little Things, which includes a special download link where you can download and print the illustrations in Curious Little Things onto your own preferred paper, you can order a copy in the Natto shop. It's only $10. At natosoup.com slash shop, I'll have a link for you guys down in the description below as well. There are loads of cute illustrations in that coloring book. And I have a whole playlist of watercolor tutorials where I actually work on illustrations from the book. I want to shout out my amazing patrons on Patreon. Their help, support, and encouragement makes tutorials like this possible. Thank you guys so much. And if you want to come hang out with me, you can find a link to my Discord server, The Paint Box, down in the description below. I hope you guys have a wonderful time. If you painted along with me, I'd love to see what you guys paint. So tag me at Natto Soup. And I look forward to seeing you guys again with another art supply review or tutorial. Bye guys!